Well, hello again, my friends, and welcome once more to the Invisible College. And we've got a great one today, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, it's called What's Up There? <laughs> and it's really to do with cosmology and how we see the universe, how we see ourselves within it, and how that's changed over time. Uh, and you might be surprised to hear this, because... The uh, general impression we get is that people have always known, you know, that there's a bunch of planets and stars and and uh, what have you up there. But the uh, the whole issue of this, the whole issue of this is really to do with um, a paradigm, or actually it's a collection of paradigms, a framework, which defines how we see the heavens, but more importantly, how we see ourselves within that paradigm, within that framework, how we fit, and from that, what we are. But I won't jump ahead. Uh, let's go on with this, and we'll see how this, this lecture develops. So, what's up there? Now, the bedrock of true philosophy and I hope you'll agree with me on this, is three questions. First is, what am I? You don't know, if you don't ask yourself that question, then you must be asleep. I mean, we must all have asked ourselves that at some stage in our lives. What am I? You know, um, you find yourself here on planet Earth, and, you know, you're a toddler, probably, when you start thinking this, and... You're aware that there's something which is you, and then there's something else, the rest of the world, uh, which includes everyone else, and you have to think, well, what am I? And the second is, who or what made me? Well, if you're a small child, you probably ask your parents, say, where did I come from? <laughs> yeah, who made me? You know, how did I get here? And the third question is, what am I for? Now, you might not have ever asked yourself that one, but it follows on from the other two. If someone or something made you and you have an identity, what are you for? What's your life for? What's it all about? And that is actually, I think, the bedrock of true philosophy. If you're not asking those questions in philosophy, it's not really philosophy that you're discussing. It's just playing with ideas, what they call sophism. Um, and you're just uh, arguing about the meaning of words or the tableness of a table and that kind of nonsense. You ought to be, I think, looking for answers to these questions, and real philosophers do. So from a philosophical standpoint, the main purpose of science, or rather scientific research, is to frame answers to these questions. Now you may not have heard science put that way before. Science, the word science, comes from the Latin scientia, which means knowledge. So the whole purpose of, of science is to gain knowledge. Gain knowledge about what? Well, obviously knowledge about the world, but more importantly, knowledge about who you are, how you got here, and what is your purpose? Because if you haven't got that, then you're just a machine. You're just um, daydreaming your way through life. Because you might be not living according to your purpose <laughs> and your, your facilities, what you're here for. So, however, in the contemporary world, Science is seen as a precursor to what is considered of far more importance, technology. Now I've chosen this picture here because it actually forms a very early form of technology where you've got, a, you've got looms, you've got um, some kind of factory with belt-driven looms, probably driven at this point by some kind of water wheel. doesn't necessarily have to have been a steam engine. Later on they, they were driven by steam engines. But that is the origins, at least in the modern times, of technology, of the means of creating machinery to do work 
far more work than could be done by humans just on their own. In this case, they're, they're making cloth and the machine can churn out cloth much more quickly than ever a person or a bunch of people could. And so it, it automates the whole process and cloth becomes much cheaper to make and therefore either cheaper to sell or more profitable to sell. And that's the whole idea of technology within the kind of corporate world, within the, uh, the retail world, is that you want to, to use technology to make profit. And this is all tied up with uh, the advance of science. Now, in fact, there is a link between science and technology is so strong that they're often lumped together in the same policy unit. So we've got here the stamp of the executive office of the president of the United States. And you can see with, written within that office of science and technology policy. So you've actually got an office which links together science with technology. And you'll find that governments particularly in the Western world, but actually now all over the world, are all the time looking to, to find out what science can, can discover that will give them an edge, that will give them some new technology, something, some, either a new way to make something they already make, but to do it cheap, more cheaply and effectively, or to invent something entirely different for which a new market can be created and therefore money can be made. So there's this intimate connection these days between science and technology, and the two go hand in hand. But it, didn't, it wasn't always like that. And in true philosophy, the whole idea of studying science, knowledge, is to understand yourself and your place in the world. So most graduates from scientific courses at university, if they don't go on to do something entirely different with their lives, for example, journalism, shopkeeping, accountancy, stock, uh, stock broking, etc., will either end up as teachers, teachers of science that would be, or working for a company making products to sell. This is, you know, if you'd study science, I did science, I did chemistry at university, and the only jobs really that you could get in chemistry were either teaching chemistry, which is a kind of closed circuit if you think about it, teaching people chemistry so they can teach chemistry, or else working for one of the um, big companies, most of which were in the north of England. Um, people like ICI, with Imperial Chemical Industries, doesn't exist anymore, or Unilever, that are making products like soap detergents and uh, paint and all sorts of other products and plastics. Uh, this is what scientists are trained for. They're not trained to be abstract thinkers or philosophers. Not usually, anyway. Thus, modern day science is very much framed around commercialization of the results of research. This, in turn, has a profound effect on the knowledge base of science. What is studied and researched is restricted to what may, in time, produce lucrative technologies. Yeah, they want to make money. Until they are retired, very few scientists are able to carry on studying science for the purpose of philosophy alone. So I'd like to stress that. Um, very interestingly, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Electric Universe, not so much in this lecture, but in later ones. I've met a number of the people who are very active in that field and nearly all of them are retired. Professor this, doctor that. Um, they're retired people. They now can devote their, their twilight days, as it were, um, to the pursuit of pure science, knowledge for knowledge's sake. But unfortunately, the way our society is structured, uh, you can't make a living that way. Um, the best minds have to go into research to make things, to make products. And that actually applies also in, for example, Cambridge University has very large um, annexes to it 
where they're developing technologies based on the latest research into things like stem cells. Um, this is why, this is how they, they make money. And this is why people are uh, going into those fields. They might not think they are when they're undergraduates, but that's kind of the goal for them is that they should then end up making money. Now then, up until around 160 years ago, it's actually very recent, the vast majority of scientists in the West were at least in name Christians. They would have answered the fundamental questions thus. What am I? A living being or soul? You've heard of that. But as the soul, anima, in Latin, it means a living being. Interestingly, we talk about animals, animals. The very name suggests that they are living beings, that they too are souls. But we don't treat them that way. We treat them as objects. Very often, you know, factory farm chickens. We treat them as though they're just units. They're just something to uh, exploit. Well, they're actually living beings as well. And then you say, who made me? Well, it'd be obvious to a, a Christian would be God made me. My parents gave birth to my body, but my soul came from God. Now, I was taught that as a boy. But many, many people these days never have any kind of religious instruction. Uh, not more than uh, the only time they'd ever go into a church, for example, might be for uh, a baptism, a marriage or a death. And um, apart from that, they don't go near the place. And they don't believe anything anyway when they do go there because they haven't been taught anything. But people who are Christians are taught that their soul comes from God. And the parents make the body by the, having sex, but the body itself is only the vessel. It's the vessel that carries the soul. And that was understood. What is my purpose? Well, to paraphrase the catechism, to serve in God's plan for the universe, to find my fulfillment, firstly by using my talents on earth and afterwards in heaven with God. So the idea was that you come into this world and you have talents, you should use those talents to the best of your ability. If it's music that you have a talent for, use it. If it's... Uh, teaching use it if it's mathematics use it if it's gardening use it these are talents that people have and we know very well from our own experience that different people have different talents yeah it's no use asking someone who hasn't got the talent to do the job they might sort of do it half-heartedly and poorly but if you want a job well done you try to find someone who has a talent to do that particular thing so we all, we're all different. So the idea that our only purpose here on Earth are, is, is to make money, um, in which case, if, if that is your purpose, it stands to reason you should go into, into the city, into banking. That's where the money is. <laughs> That's where you're likely to get the most. So go into banking, but you might not have a talent for that. And you might end up going into that and being very, very unhappy because you're not actually using the talent you've really got, which might be something creative, like composing music, for which there's no money. Um, this is uh, the problem that we have in our age, when we don't even address these questions, and we just leave it to chance. Now, the medieval worldview was that standing above the physical plane and even out of the stars and planets was the invisible world of spirit. In this painting you'll find this in the, the uh, National Gallery in London and it's a very good example to show you. What you're seeing here is the coronation, coronation of Mary in heaven. This is a part of the, uh, the doctrine of, of Christianity that Mary, the mother of Jesus, ascended into heaven. She's assumed into heaven, body and soul all in one and then crowned. Well, you don't have to believe that. But the <clears throat> situation here is you've got three concentric circles 
and the circle kirkus is the same root as choir. A choir is really a circle. And so there's three circles of ascending grades, as you, you can see. And the one nearest to the earth would be the lowest grade. And that would be kind of angels and saints who interact with human beings on, a, on the spirit plane. And above them are higher angels, more like archangelly type things. And then at the top at the top level, you've got the very, very high angels, the seraphims and cherubim and all those kind of angels. So this was understood in medieval times. And people took it for granted that above and beyond the physical universe that we could see, above and beyond the, the uh, spheres of the planets, I should tell you that the solar system itself with the planets was called the lower heavens and then beyond that there was the realm of the fixed stars which which they saw as being another rim around that we call them fixed because they don't change their positions in relation to one to another at least not within a, a reasonable period of not even just one lifespan but many uh, whereas the planets are moving around through the through the zodiac as you know and then but they believe that beyond those stars, those vi the visible universe, that would be the higher heavens, the, the, is the realms of the angels and God. So you had the physical universe, and then beyond that you had these choirs of angels and God up above, invisible, because it's above the physical creation. So that was a standard view within Christianity, and I think it's, it's true of many different religions too, although I haven't studied them. So in the uppermost sphere sat the enthroned Christ, you can see him there, sitting there, and here he's shown in the act of crowning the Virgin Mary as Queen of Heaven. Now I've, I've done another uh, video on this whole thing, what does Mary represent, uh, why is she robed in blue? And it's because she's a sort of stand-in for planet Earth. But I've done a whole other lecture on that, which you can have a look at if you are interested. Now, this all began to change with the publication in 1543 of De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, which means concerning the turn, turning of the celestial spheres, by the Polish astronomer Nikolai Copernicus. You can see him there. He actually waited until he was dying before he had it published. He'd written it some time earlier. But he waited till he was dying and they put placed the finished copies on his bed, you know, for him to have a look at. Because he knew that he would be in big trouble for this with the church. Uh, they weren't going to like this one little bit. But if he's dead, there's not much they're going to be able to do to him. And he demonstrated that the sun and not the earth must be at the centre of the solar system. And you can see it there on this diagram. You've got now the Sun in the centre, and then you've got the orbits of Mercury and Venus, and then you have the orbit of the Earth, uh, the third planet out from the Sun. You can see the orbit of the Moon going round it. So he recognised that the Moon goes round the Earth, but the Earth goes round the Sun. And then you've got the orbits of other planets going out, and then you have the... Uh, celestial sphere of the fixed stars. You can see that round there. Now interestingly Copernicus, he still thought that the Sun was now at the centre of the universe. But it wasn't, wasn't the Earth anymore, it was the Sun. He hadn't quite made the next leap, which is to say, where is the centre of the universe? Now this at first sight small change in paradigm produced religious repercussions. Giordano Bruno, you can see him there in the statue, uh, his heresies, which included belief in heliocentrism, that means the sun at the centre, inhabited planets, he believed that the other stars were also suns, and that they had planets going round them, and that on those planets there were very likely people like us. And he's made the most terrible uh, speculation that you know you couldn't possibly ask, is did Jesus need to die on the cross to save them as well as us? Or did he need to go to all those planets and die on those planets as well? 
I mean, that's the sort of question you just don't ask. <laughs> and he got himself into deep water and trouble. And he was hauled up before the Inquisition. So in 1600, he was taken to the Campo di Fiori in Rome and burnt at the stake. And he's regarded by many as the first martyr of science. And that statue is actually placed on the location in the Campo di Fiori in Rome where he was burnt. Um, and in 1633, Galileo Galilei, Italy's greatest scientist, narrowly escaped a similar fate. Fortunately for him, his fame and popularity came to his rescue. Though found guilty and forced to repent of his heresies, mainly that the earth turns on its axis, I should also add that uh, Galileo, um, he had a telescope. We talked about this in the last lecture, I think. One of the first people to use a telescope, and he pointed that telescope at the moon and discovered that it was not a nice smooth body that everyone thought it was, that it was pockmarked. And how dare he suggest that God's beautiful universe, uh, his wonderful moon, could be pockmarked. And then he, he went even further, he pointed his telescope at Jupiter, and he discovered that it had moons. The first four Jovian moons, which are now referred to as Galilean moons. We now know that Jupiter has many, many more moons than that. I think it's up to about 30 that, that are known. Um, but Jupiter was supposed to be just a planet. It wasn't meant to have moons. So this, these discoveries, where they were very, very unhappy with Galileo for championing the idea that the sun was at the center of the universe, not the Earth, and for discovering other moons around other planets. And, you know, this whole can of worms that he was opening... As Pandora's box as they would see it that was going to cause unbelief um, they had him put under house arrest so <clears throat> his sentence was commuted to house imprisonment however on being sentenced he's said to have muttered under his breath still it turns meaning the earth he had said that the earth turns on its axis which is why we have days it's not that everything's going around us, it's that we're rotating, our, our planet rotates. And they didn't like that at all. Anyway, but he was put under house arrest. And this was as late as 1633, really almost modern times. Outside of Rome, by 1622, that's 11 years earlier than this, at the start of what would be later be termed the Enlightenment, a more mechanistic view of the universe was taking shape. This is taken from an alchemical textbook, Philosophia Reformata, but the pictures in it actually are nothing really to do with alchemy, or only indirectly. They, people had to, con, you know, to uh, place their knowledge in pl positions where it couldn't be understood by those who weren't initiated. And so they used alchemy as a vehicle to talk among themselves about this subject or this kind of subject in a way and they could just say well actually you know we're just busy trying to make gold and you know maybe we'll make you some you know and so the kings and people would leave them alone well great you know if you can make me some gold that's that would be wonderful and so these these philosophers were able to discuss their ideas in private just sharing impenetrable diagrams like this, that if you didn't know what you're looking at, you wouldn't understand it. Here, male and female forces are seen as polarities. These are represented in the heavens, and you can see up in the corners of the picture there, by the sun and moon. And they're mirrored on earth by the sexual polarity of man and woman. You can see that man stands on a sun and woman stands on a moon. So just as man and woman are polarities, unless you're a modern person and you don't believe there's a difference in sexes, then uh, you would understand that, that man, man is one polarity, woman is another polarity. And similarly, that the sun and moon were polarities. And you can see the influence of the sun and moon being directed downwards onto the, um, the earth and on the couple and blending together there. 
So there's this idea of these emanations coming and what are influencing life on Earth. And I suppose you could say with moon, it's not so much the moonlight as, as darkness and, uh, and, and cold, whereas the sun is light and hot. And these two driving forces we know very well are polarities. And actually all heat engines work on that polarity between a hot reservoir, as they call it, and a cold reservoir. And I'm not going to go into thermodynamics here, but this is uh, at the basis of a lot of our technology and science, especially in, in the 19th century, um, when they, in the steam age. And the Earth itself is seen as deriving from the geometry of the squared circle with a triangle surrounding it. Uh, is, and, and surrounding that is the celestial sphere of the stars. God in his heaven is noticeably absent. Uh, that's an important point here, that we're not considering the higher planes in this diagram. We're now looking at the universe from a purely mechanistic and uh, emanationally uh, viewpoint. There's plus and minus, there's, there's uh, sun and moon, man and woman, there's plus and minus, there's a blending together uh, of the law of two uh, to make three. And so that was kind of understood. Now then, this theme echoes an engraving, an epigram, uh, by the Rosicrucian philosopher Michael Mayer in his famous book Atalanta Fugians. And I've talked about that book before. The picture shows an Eastern philosopher almost certainly representing Hermes Trismegistus, who we've also met many times before. He's the equivalent in the Bible of, of the prophet Enoch. So this picture shows an Eastern philosopher, almost certainly representing Hermes Trismegistus, exploring the geometry of the circle, square and triangle. Now that makes a lot of sense because Hermes is credited with in inventing the pyramids and building the pyramids, which in, in Arabic are called Al-Haram. Al um, which means the pyramids. So Haram means uh, from Hermes. So th this, is, this connection between geometry and Hermes is very clear. And here we're seeing how the earth itself stems out from the geometry of the square and the circle and the triangle, and very much to do with pyramid research. Within are the male and female polarities, again symbolized as man and woman. So Hermes is again understanding science from this point of view of, of these polarities and how geometry and the symbols of geometry underpin it. And on the ground are the tools of the trade of a master mason. Now I'm not a Freemason, but I do know that they look back to Hermes or Thoth uh, in Egypt as one of the major sources of, of their, um, their art, if I can call it that, or their brotherhood. So, and they use these same symbols, the set square and the protractor, the compasses. So these are all kind of Masonic instruments. And of course they go back really to the builders of the great cathedrals in Europe, which are very geometric. And if you didn't understand geometry, you wouldn't be able to construct them. In fact, in Italian, they refer to architects as geometers. I don't know if you know that. I only discovered that quite recently. But anyway, so if you studied geometry, it's probably so you were going to become an architect. Architecture uh, was very, very dependent upon geometry. So he seems to be drawing his diagram onto a wall perhaps indicating the role of sacred geometry in architecture. And I'd also like to point out that these, you can kind of see on that wall, uh, irregular shapes. It look like maybe plaster or something that's stuck on the wall. I think they kind of represent consonants. So he's kind of looking at how the consonants of the earth, at least as understood at that time, somehow are connected with this whole idea of the architecture of the planet. But that's another subject, isn't it? Again, God is notably absent, except as an abstraction of the perfection of figures and the polarities of forces. 
Polarities of forces, the male and female, obviously, and the perfection of figures being the geometry that's employed in making um, the universe. So Hermes, who's, the, as I said, was the builder of the pyramids, supposedly, he's emulating God in the sense that he's using the same laws and same ideas uh, to come up with his shapes. And of course, the Great Pyramid in particular has a base which is based on the squared circle. And of course, it's a triangular faces. So it's all there. Now, in 1795, William Blake lampooned the Enlightenment with his engraving of Sir Isaac Newton practicing geometry in a similar way. So there you can see Isaac Newton strip naked and he's, he's uh, doing geometry and there he has he's got his compasses he's emulating God and Newton is shown naked apparently at the bottom of the sea he is so intent on his drawing operations that he fails to even notice where he actually is or the beauty around him in other words he's not noticing nature or the fact that although nature does have geometrical aspects to it is also very irregular um, but he's not taking any notice of that he's just focusing on uh, the laws that he's uncovering and digging into to understand how the material universe works and Blake himself was a poet and um, he was also a, an artist and he made a lot of um, uh, prints prints of books with his poems illustrated and he's famous for that. But he was a mystic too, that had a lot of visions and reveries and, and so forth. So he was the kind of polar opposite of Newton. And he abhorred the Industrial Revolution, which was happening in his time, as being um, against nature and against human humanness. So he was kind of using Newton as the cause of a lot of this trouble, as he would see it, and showing how he had ignored what existed. However, this was somewhat unfair of Blake. Yeah, it was. In reality, Newton was not just a scientist, but also something of a mystic himself. In other words, I mean, we now know a lot of Newton's papers were kept hidden for um, centuries. They only came, I think it was uh, Maynard Keynes who bought up Newton's papers from Cambridge University. And then he had them hidden because he felt that Newton's interest in things like alchemy and, and uh, the, the Book of Revelation, you know, Newton wrote profuse amounts on the Book of Revelation and the Temple of Solomon and what it all symbolized and means. He was a mystic and he, th he felt that that besmirched his science. So all those papers were hidden away and someone like William Blake would not have heard of the side of him. It's only fairly recently that those papers came out and we now know a much more rounded view of, of Isaac Newton than uh, would have been known then. Anyway, he's used here as a symbol of the Enlightenment and, and for that he's without equal. For Newton's laws of motion and gravity still dominate astro astrophysics today. Now, a word about that. Astrophysics is the physics of the stars, astro star. And, of course, you can't actually go and measure a star. You can't actually go out there and sample it with a test tube. All you can do is you can measure light or other vibrations like um, infrared or x-rays, um, radio waves, whatever, coming from the universe. And, of course, there's this latest um, telescope that's just been put up there. We've had the Hubble before of the James Webb which I believe is going to, is a, a radio telescope. And they, they look upon how they can use this to go back in time, they say. Well, really? You only, it's only because they have a model that suggests that certain energies represent different time scales that they could even think that. So it, they're not actually measuring that. It's not genuine science. Sorry to say that. But it's true, and it's actually science that's been disproved, but we will talk about that another time. Um, anyway, so that's how things stand today. Now, 
A statue of Isaac Newton, Britain's greatest scientist, well, he's without doubt that, can today be seen outside the British Library in London. And you can see the uh, similarity of that to what you were just looking at. This model was created by sculptor Edouard Paolozzi for the opening of the building in 1995. Now, I presume he's Italian from his name, Edoardo Paolozzi. The sculpture is said to have been inspired by the contrast between Blake as a visionary poet and artist and Newton as a scientist who sees how things work. This is emphasised by the way his body itself is seen as like a machine. So you can see the bolts going through his ankles and his hips and his shoulders um, and he's strapped down. It's like he is, it, it's emphasising that he's like um, an automaton. Um, he's a robot <laughs> in a sense. We all are in a sense in that our bodies are physical aspects of ourselves and they are mechanical in the way that they work. So he's emphasising that there. The mechanical man studying the mecha mechanisms of the universe. Paolozzi's Newton may not really be what Blake had in mind, but it is an accurate representation of how the modern world views nature. In other words, the modern world views nature as being mechanical mechanisms. And yes, the science has progressed a lot since Newton's day. We know a lot about things like DNA codes, for instance, and how those influence the growth of plants and animals. But we're still actually very, very ignorant. And we're still caught up in this question of uh, what science for? That science is for technology. Science is for making money out of exploiting science. And that, I'm afraid, is the sin of the modern age. But anyway, it, it has its antecedents there. And in November 1859, Charles Darwin published his seminal work on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. And there you can see Charles Darwin and some of the finches and it, it was the shape of their beaks that uh, inspired him to, to make his discoveries about adaptation. And Darwin asserted that life on Earth arose spontaneously, began as a single-celled organism, but then through a process of random mutation, tempered by natural selection of the fittest, developed to become the many species we see today. So this is now taught really as dogma. And again, I've done, another, I've done three lectures on, on um, uh, Darwinism which you can go and have a look at. And I'm very skeptical about Darwinism, but from his time, uh, they, bu they built the first um, natural history museum. I think the London one was first, but there are others all over the world now, of course. And it's built to look like a cathedral because what he was really preaching was a new religion, a religion of materialism, that nothing... Uh, uh, there's no God involved in anything. It's all spontaneous. And then it's mechanical in the way things work out. Survival of the fittest. And that brings us to this famous diagram that we looked at, looked at in, um, I think, the last lecture. And the upshot of this new science was a purging of the old orthodoxy. Instead of being an immortal, a mortal soul created by God, Man was now just one of a myriad of adaptations by spontaneous chance events. So there we see man striding out. Yes, he's the most advanced. He's come from the chimpanzees. And he's worked his way up through all these homos, homo erectus, and the rest of them. <laughs> Sorry about the name. Um, and there he is. He's striding ahead. Well, how many men look like that, eh? Uh, these days he'd probably have a pot belly. But there we go. His remote ancestors were apes, themselves uh, deriving from more primitive mammals. They in turn were ultimately descended from the first primitive one-celled organisms. So Darwin's tree of life looks a bit like this. Uh, we've looked at this in previous lectures too. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection changed everything. 
Human life was now to be viewed as simply a series of chance events. It therefore had no intrinsic purpose. And I'd like to get that point over. If you believe that everything happens by chance events, there cannot be any purpose. It, it goes without saying, doesn't it? If everything is just random chance, then there's no purpose to it. It just is. It's just there. It's just a result of random chance. It might have been something else. It's this. And that change, that is a, a philosophical statement. That is not a scientific statement. Because by creating this new religion of Darwinism, and that's what it is, he took away purpose from the human race. Everything then just becomes whatever we want it to be. So this changes all the answers. Number one, what am I? Right, well the new answer is a living creature like any other that will eventually die without trace. All those other ones you see in the tree there, all the dinosaurs and the various kind of worms and most of them have all disappeared and died, the mammoths, a lot. And one day the human race will die out without trace, maybe leaving a few fossils, and that will be it. There will be something else, something better maybe? Who knows? Who made me? Nobody did. I rose just by chance. There is no God and so no creator. That's the second tenet of Darwinism when it's properly understood. You don't have a creator under this. Yeah, you're just a random chance. You're like a pebble that's been washed by the sea and get made shiny. That's, you know, there's no more purpose to you than that. And you may as well get used to it because you've got 70 years plus, maybe, if you're lucky. And then, um, you know, ashes to ashes, you're gone, that's it. The only thing that will remain of you is maybe a few books or paintings that you've made and maybe if you had children, some progeny, but nothing else. And Forget about going to heaven. There will be no heaven for you. This is what Darwinism teaches. And three, what is my purpose? I have none and therefore can do what I like just so long as I don't get caught. And don't we just see that today? The situation, the idea that you should have a conscience about anything is gone. You know, we, we pay lip service to the law or whatever, but... Laws can just be changed at, the, at a whim. If the law doesn't suit the, the those in power, they just change it. There's no kind of sense that they've got a higher um, uh, law to um, answer to in due course. The idea that the king wears his crown because that crown you know, is God-given, the sovereignty of the nation, that he's got to look after it doesn't exist he's just there because he's there and he can exploit it as he likes and this we're seeing now is coming to a head the um the final fruition of that whole process is happening now so you have no purpose and therefore can do what i like just so long as i don't get caught The belief that we have no intrinsic purpose other than to maintain dominance as the fittest for natural selection is the downfall of science. And I'll just show you this poster of Tarzan of the Apes. That's kind of the, the Darwinian concept that man, yeah, he's the crown of creation, all right? And he's, as long as he's dominant, as long as he can slay the apes and, and stay on top, He's there. This philosophical paradigm leads to selfishness bordering on insanity. For if one's own life has no purpose, then neither does anyone else's. If they're not useful to me, then they're dispensable. This is how psychopaths think, with no compassion or remorse of conscience. Yeah, it's how death camps are set up and people run them as though they're, they're dealing with battery hens, um, you know, processing them through a factory. That's how that can happen. Because the general belief is that nothing has any purpose. So what's it matter? What's it matter what you do? 
What's it matter if you uh, corrupt a whole generation? What's it matter if you abuse children? If you have this mindset, this kind of um, uh, having dismissed God, and there's no God, so you're not created by any God, you're just a random chance, there's no real morality. You might think you can invent a morality, but it has no real substance to it because there's no one that you have to answer to. Well, you think there isn't, but there is, of course. <clears throat> to a somewhat lesser degree, we're all guilty of this sin when we treat nature as also being without purpose. So when we despise and destroy nature for the sake of uh, profit, then we are actually being just as bad as this. And we wouldn't do it if we had respect for our planet, but we don't. And so many so-called, um, this is actually the driving force behind a lot of what we call the green movement. The idea of, of horror at the way that nature has been abused. Um, it comes from a very real thing, and I do understand that, and I accept it, and I agree with it. The only flaw in the argument there, though, is that if you do things like um, destroy the means of production of of food you know because you don't like the way it's being grown or you insist on closing down all the coal mines or the, the energy sources that um, you feel are polluting the atmosphere well when you've got a population of seven billion on the planet it's not that difficult to push it over the edge and cause mass starvation and famine and huge numbers of deaths so you've got to tread very very carefully here um, and I'm afraid that what's unfortunately happening is because there is this revulsion, particularly among the young, against the mechanization and the, the treatment of nature as just a thing to be exploited, um, to swing too far the other way too quickly, and um, to get to a situation where we're not actually um, able to support the population that we've got and to cause catastrophe and the collapse of civilization. What we really need to do is to get back to connection. And I've been talking about that in some of my other lectures, that we need to get to the point where we are connected directly to the thread of life force that comes through the universe um, in the form of an electric current or something similar. Um, but that is a whole other subject. But if we could do that, we would not have the same needs that we have now. The needs to eat, the needs to be clothed, to need houses, all of these things that, that are such, such pressing needs for us today. We wouldn't need so much. Plus, this earth has, has got a bottleneck of souls on it. There's too many here. It's because there hasn't been a chance for graduation ceremonies you know, for thousands of years. And we need to get to a point where a large number of people can move back up the tree, back up to heaven, to move on to other planets and solar systems and, and whatever they're going to do in higher worlds and to leave more space on this planet for an easier way of doing it. Now, the globalists want to do that, but they want to do it a different way. They just want to kill off the ones they don't like and don't want and keep the planet for themselves to exploit to their heart's content. You know, they'd like you to go and live on the moon, working a factory in space, um, making the products that they would like then to use on Earth. But you aren't going to come and breathe the air here. You're not going to swim in the sea. You're going to live on the moon in a space suit. <laughs> that's, that's the Jeff Bezos view of the future. Um, well, I don't buy it. And, but what we do need is graduation and we're coming to that which is the whole thing about the book of revelation that's what it's all about it's about graduation day um and a big change on this planet is going to happen but it's not going to happen the way that the globalists think it is so now we come to the famous wood engraving it's attributed to a frenchman camille flammarion it first appears in a book by him, L'Atmosphère Météorologie Populaire, 
excuse my French accent, first published in 1888. And you can see there, there's a, a man, a figure, and he's peeping out through the edge of the um, celestial sphere. And he's seeing what goes on behind it, the me mechanics behind it all. It shows a new, more scientific view of the weather forecaster as astrophysicist. He looks beyond the mundane, earthly world at how the heavenly machine works. And you can see all the cogwheels there and the things happening, wheels within wheels. And you can see various cloud formations and, and lightning flashes. This is what's driving the, the weather, he feels, and he discovers. Now you've got to study the stars, or what beyond the stars, to understand it. So he peers through the celestial sphere to discern the mechanics during the weather, uh, driving the weather, the meteorology. He sees this as nothing more than the outworking of planetary and stellar influences. In other words, the sky and everything it contains is just a machine whose purpose is to influence the weather on Earth. So we've come full circle, haven't we? We've come to the opposite extreme from the idea that beyond the celestial sphere we have those concentric spheres of of the angels and saints with Jesus Christ sitting on his throne at the centre of it or in the highest sphere to looking at it as just a bunch of um, mechanisms just like clockwork working in the background driving everything and, and causing the weather So we see that of paramount importance to all scientific discourse in our, is our world view. So there's one world view. And put simply, this is a collection of paradigms. Scientific, philosophic, cultural, artistic, legalistic and political that frame the collective narrative of who we are and where we come from. So I want to stress that. We all live by a collective narrative. The collective narrative, it includes our creation myth, by the way. Um, the collective narrative of the Christian world was the Bible, up until quite recently. Now it's scientism, with other aspects of it, Darwinism, this kind of mechanistic view of the world as uh, just a conglomeration of processes, natural processes that interact one with another, and for some reason, we don't know why, life arose spontaneously on this particular planet, not on any of the others as far as we can tell in the solar system. Maybe, maybe on a planet around another star, but they're so far away you will never get to sort of speak to the people there. Unless you believe in UFOs, in which case, yeah, maybe they, they've got some technology that we haven't got. And notice I use the word technology, because always the UFO ideas, the flying saucer, it's something similar to what we might make, it's something out of metal that comes here that people can sit in and ride in, yeah, and they can cross space with it and they can arrive here. It's a mechanistic um, idea that if only we had the technology they've got, we could go back to visit them. Um, it's a, that is the viewpoint of the modern world and it's corrupt. We have to get back to the spiritual viewpoint to understand that we are souls. Souls can travel through the universe. They don't need spaceships. Um, we will find that out. Uh, if you, when you die, you will find it out. But unfortunately, we live in this materialistic, mechanistic world, which is always looking for profit and looking for new methods of, of killing, new weapon systems that can give dominance of one nation over another nation, or one group of nations over another group of nations. And that is the world that we live in today. We need to remember this world, the idea that there are higher worlds above this, supernatural worlds, and that, that real progress, real development, opens the door to those higher worlds for us to go, to graduate to, to go up into those circles. And maybe we'll find other purpose, other you know, jobs and things that we will be doing as befits um, sons and daughters of God. 
So prior to this enlightenment, the worldview of the Western world was created on Christian motifs. Above our world was the heavenly where the will of God was supreme. The hope and expectation of Christians was that after death, as souls, without bodies, they would one day return to those heavenly spheres. I know that might seem daft to a lot of people who haven't um, had a religious education and they haven't had any kind of out-of-body experiences. But talk to people who have. Uh, on YouTube you'll find lots and lots of um, uh, little lectures and programs and interviews with people who have had out-of-body experiences. People who've died on the operating table, found themselves outside their body, spent some time in this other world. They may be gone to through a tube of light and found themselves in heaven. And then they've been told they have to come back and they come back into the body and they wake up. There's lots of stories like this you'll find. And they're not all bogus. Research it and you'll find out that you're not just a worm. You're not just um, an intelligent ape, uh, a machine like uh, that statue of Newton. You are a living being. You are a soul. And as such, you have both responsibilities and prospects. So the modern science view is essentially atheistic. Though our telescopes look ever deeper into space, they offer us no comfort. The model of a universe that contained choirs of angels and saints around the throne of Jesus has been replaced by its modern equivalent, the form of, of diagram of stars and galaxies after a big bang in the dim and distant past. So you can see on the left here, this diagram is bang, and out goes this trumpet. And you get, you know, over time, first milli, milli, milliseconds, and then what happens and gradually how atoms are formed, and then it, it forms uh, galaxies and they, they expand and go outwards. This is a modern creation myth and it's complete nonsense. But it's taught in all schools, it's taught in universities, it's, it's, it's uh, chanted over and over on television, on the BBC and others. It's only a theory and it's not a very good theory. We need to get beyond it. Sadly, this model leaves no room for the supernatural side of life. I mean, you bet it doesn't. It also does not answer the questions. What happened before the Big Bang? How did the universe come out of nothing? So you might think you answered the, the, uh, the solution to the creation, but you haven't. Uh, <laughs> you still haven't, because you'll just say it just comes out of nothing. Well, what is that nothing and where does it come from? You haven't got a creator in this theory. You, can't, you haven't got a creator saying, I'm going to create a universe, let there be light, or whatever. Um, you've just got a big bang. Well, big bangs don't just happen, do they? You need something to go bang, and you need, you need to know where that's come from. It's like looking at a human body without ever speaking to the man or woman who inhabits that body. It ignores entirely the soul, the most important aspect of a person. And I just want to point that out, you know, you can look at a body, you can take bits out and put them under a microscope and study them, you can look at the bones, you can look at the flesh, you can do all this. If you never actually meet the person whose body that is, you haven't got a clue about their nature, about their, their dreams, their hopes, their, their wishes, their, their memories, their everything that makes them human. What makes me human is not just this body, this physical body. It's me, the soul of Adrian. That's what makes me real. And it's the same for you. Um, you have your own identity. Yes, you have a body similar to mine. But you're, you're a soul. And you have your own experience, identity, wishes, hopes, talents, abilities, failings, strengths. All of that it makes up you. And you're very precious because of that. And we need to get back to an understanding that, that brings back the supernatural into our lives and makes it part and parcel of our collective um, uh, collection of um, paradigms and theories and theses and what have you that makes up our worldview, our mythology. We need to get back 
and to find something that is more satisfying for our times than this materialistic philosophy that we find ourselves within now. So we need a new and better model of the universe, one that embraces the idea of the supernatural. Such a model was devised and taught by this man, G.I. Gurdjieff, during and immediately after the First World War. Now, I've talked about him before. I think he was one of the smartest people in the 20th century. And his ideas, even today, are worth investigating and looking at. They also need further development which I'm trying to do in my own way and uh, or I have done for myself and I'm going to share with you in the next lecture. Coupled with a new scientific paradigm often referred to as the electric universe we have the beginnings of a much more inclusive framework than the overhyped Big Bang Theory. Yes it's overhyped all right. So we need to be looking to, to put the supernatural, the super back into the natural to begin to understand a, a more holistic view of ourselves and where we come from and where we're going. We'll examine these themes in Secrets of the Ray of Creation, the next lecture in this series. So, thank you everybody. Um, I hope you, you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Um, yeah, we've got a lot to cover and I'm not only going to be doing uh, lectures on science. I'm going to get on with doing some more on the Book of Revelation. I'm doing other series with the members of the college, uh, particularly on Egypt, and I'm going to be carrying on developing lectures which are available only for them. But if you want to join the college, it's very easy to do. You do it through patreon.com. And uh, if you go to patreon.com, Adrian Gilbert, I think it is, uh, you'll find me there and you'll find out how you can how you can join the college it only costs you five pounds a month it's a price price for a pint of beer <laughs> well okay maybe a bottle of cheap wine um but anyway you'll find that uh, we're doing other stuff there and that's going to grow it's going to grow more and more and i've got a lot of plans for the college and i want it to develop to be having live lectures and i'd like to be doing lectures online and eventually I'd like to be doing lectures where we gather together in the same room. Hopefully you won't all have to be wearing masks by that time. Um, we'll be able to gather together and, and discuss things in person. But that might be a few years down the line, I don't know. Um, but for now, get on to the college. You'll enjoy it, you'll find it's useful. I'm, going to, I'm in the process of putting together a website uh, I'm getting there. It's a lot of hard work to do it. And I'm also having to do these lectures at the same time. So my time is limited. But you'll find that there. Um, please, if you haven't already done so, like this video and subscribe to the channel. We're up to 790 now. We need 10 more to get to 800. That would be a great milestone. And then we need another 200 to get to the magic 1000 figure which you need to be at before, before YouTube takes you seriously. Um, well, let's see if we can get to 800 first. I just need 10 more, 10 more people subscribe to the channel. So if, you, if you're new to this, give it a subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and we'll take it from there. If you don't want to join the college, but you want to stay in touch, just send me an email, admin.invisiblecollege at protonmail.com. And I'll add you to the list, the, the mailing list. You won't be spammed. Your, your, your email address won't be given to anyone. It won't be sold to anyone. There'll be no advertising. Nothing like that. It just means that we'll be able to stay in touch should something happen with YouTube or whatever. So thank you again for your time. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Take care.